Join me in the responsive reading in your bulletin. God said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. Please be seated. Listen to God's word of love from the prophet Isaiah. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather them from the west. I will bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I form and made. The first candle we light this Advent season is the candle of hope. Our hope is in God who is merciful and gracious. The second candle of Advent is the candle of peace. May we find peace through the comfort and tenderness of our God. The pink candle is the candle of joy. The ultimate gift is in the coming of the Lord and the establishing of God's kingdom. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we now light the candle of love. We are the children of God because of God's love for us. Let us pray. Almighty God, open our hearts to your love this Christmas. Love beyond limits. Love without exceptions. Love that is embodied in the birth of your son this holy season. Amen. Let us stand together and sing again verses 1 through 4 of our Advent hymn.
You can now do away with that hymn sitting in your pews. That's the last time we'll sing that one. We did all four verses, so we're done. Let's join together in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, whose reign we have denied and whose purposes we have opposed, we pray for forgiveness and healing. We confess that self-concern rather than your will often motivates us. We have claimed to follow Jesus, but our discipleship has been half-hearted and our worship has been empty of passion and expectation. Turn us around and claim us for your purpose. Give us hearts eager to serve the needs of those you came to save. In your son's name we pray, amen. God loves us and frees us from our sins. Those who are of the truth will hear God's voice and will bear witness to God's salvation. God is our righteousness and our security. As the angels have foretold so long ago, there is no need to fear. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
I have to tell you that the, the snowfall Wednesday into Thursday got in the way a little bit of this praise team preparing for this morning. So they came in and did it now. Um, and the reason they prepare so hard, and they do, there's a new camera, there's a new sound system, they are trying so hard to get all of it working together adequately so that what we post online for all of you folks who are home is something of quality. I would also say that um, we have a couple of folks here who gave their time and effort and always do. Um, Jordan Kenyon takes care of the sidewalks and the ramp always when it snows. Jack helped this time with the snow blower. That was a lot of snow. And why do they do it? It's not a sense of obligation. It is out of love. It's out of love for all those who can't be here, all of you who are watching us from your homes. We want to give you the best worship experience that we can give you. Louise is always here playing the organ. Others are always here to do their part. And they do it out of love for this place and for the people. So God bless all of you for what you do. Thank you. We need to pray too for um, the folks whose unemployment, et cetera, has, is running out within the next week. Um, you know, the, the food pantry and social ministry fund were not hit too hard over the summer. And, and I thought, wow, that, that's unexpected. But it was thanks to the unemployment and, and the benefits that we had. Those are now running out and more and more calls are coming in. Can't pay our mortgage. That, you know, mortgage forgiveness gives, is, is done the 1st of January and people are scared they're going to lose their homes. And it's, you know, the cities have seen it now for months. We're seeing it now in our little valley. Um, so just, just pray for folks to be able to, to make it through. And pray that God use us wherever he can to help them. Let's bow our heads. If we took all of our concerns, if we took all the worries we carry on our hearts, if we took some of the anger we feel toward those who are not helping us when it is their job to help us, if we took our fear, our anxiety, our disappointment and depression with the holidays, if we put them all together, Lord, and asked you for help with them, there is but one answer. And you gave that answer in a stable. There is only Jesus Christ. Humans will always fail one another. We are sinful. People will not meet our needs. Creation will groan. Awful things will happen. And there is only one answer, no matter what it be. And that is Jesus. Some will come through COVID after weeks in the hospital. Others will have COVID and have a few sniffles and, and walk away. And still others will never return home and will die without family. And the answer, Lord, is, is your son. It, it matters not what weighs us down right now. The answer in, in all of its myriad of details is Jesus. Without him, 
Christmas is Santa Claus. But with him, there is new hope. And there is light and laughter. There is joy. And there is love. We're grateful, Lord, that we know your son. Grateful for the peace that he gives us at this time. And Lord, we we pray to be vessels that will bring that news to others that don't know you. Use us to shine that light into darkened hearts. Help our government. Help other governments. There is no one who seems to have gotten this right. We blame and we look for scapegoats with why it's so bad, but no matter where we look, it is the same. We are faced with something beyond our ability to control. And if we would only admit it, our lives are like that. A lot. And the only peace we can find is the peace that we find in you. Grant us that. Be with your world, Lord. Hold it in the palm of your hand. And we are of all to be pitied if all we wish for is a baby in a manger. Lord, we ask for a savior on his throne to come to make this world into what you created it to be to do away with tears and heartache and death and all of it we know is a promise that you will keep and we say come Lord Jesus as we pray the words he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture passage um, is a lectionary passage given to us in Christmas, but it's a little different than the fair that I usually go to. So listen to the word of God from 2 Samuel. After the king was settled in his palace... And the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you a ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. 
and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. You know, it's tough to be on the receiving end of love. I mean, maybe here in America it's actually harder than anywhere else in the world. I mean, after all, think about it. We are made from hardy explorer stock, pioneer blood. We tamed a wild continent after all. We're independent, self-made, stand on your own two feet, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of people. We don't like asking for help. And we're even worse receiving it. It's really tough for us to be on the receiving end of love. Over the years, David has received blessing upon blessing from God. And now the hard times are over. The new nation is settled in the new capital of Jerusalem. David is so thankful, and he wants to show the Lord the love that he has for him. I mean, God's been running around in a tent now for generations. And David decides he wants to pay him back, as it were. I'll build a temple for God to call home, he says. No more tent flaps blowing in the wind. And he broaches the idea to the prophet Nathan, and Nathan says, sure, go ahead. God loves you. Go ahead and do it. And it's at this point then that God gets involved. Nah, he says, a tent's good enough for me. Nobody is going to tie me down unless I decide I want to be tied down. But tell you what, David, old buddy, old pal, I'm going to give you another gift because I love you for loving me. I'll promise that I will make a house out of you. When the Lord declares that he will establish a house for him, He's talking about the house of David, the dynasty of King David, a never broken line of kingly succession. The ancient Israelites knew from the prophecies that the Messiah would be born from David's lineage. This is where it comes from. You go either to the first chapter of Matthew's gospel or go to the third chapter of the gospel of Luke and read Jesus' genealogy. Jesus is born in the line of David. This is where another one of those 315 prophecies in the Bible about the coming of the Messiah comes true. So God says no to David's plan. The temple will come when the time is right, in God's good time, and by God's chosen person, David's son Solomon. My guess is that most, or if not all of us, have been on the receiving end, right out of the blue, of a gift we didn't see coming. It comes from someone we really don't know all that well. It comes 
from someone that we don't exchange gifts with at Christmas, and it turns out to be something really nice. Maybe not something we would have thought of or bought for ourselves, but now that we've got one in our hands, we find out we really like this thing, and that's pretty cool. But it's from somebody we're not that close to. And now we feel beholden. So now what are we going to do with this gift? Well, we got to pay it back. We try to come up with a gift to give them in return and make it look like, oh, we, we were going to do this all along. Oh, thank you for the gift. I, I left yours at home. I'll go get it and, and give it to you. We're not doing this out of gratitude or out of friendship. We are gifting in return, mostly because we feel obligated now to do so, and because we feel guilty. It doesn't feel good inside to receive like that without reciprocating. We don't like that feeling of indebtedness. Somehow that gift then lays a claim upon us. It's uncomfortable. And by, by giving a gift to us, this person now has an unspoken power over us. They don't mean to, but that's what happens. We feel like if they ask us a favor, we can't say no because now we kind of owe them. Remember, we are those independent pioneers who would never ask anybody for help. And now we're stuck. How do you go about restoring that equilibrium? Well, Jesus tells us that it's more blessed to give than to receive, but it's also a whole lot more comfortable to give. We don't like to receive. Think about what it feels like if somebody just simply gives you a compliment. How many of us could just say, oh, thanks, and let it go at that, instead of belittling ourselves, putting ourselves down, putting down our accomplishment, feeling self-conscious or undeserving about what they said? Well, there was a handful of us who got together yesterday to deliver those Christmas bags that Lori talked about to about three dozen families. And it was fun, and it was fellowship and laughter during COVID, which you're not allowed to do is laugh out loud together. What a blessing it was. It felt good to put the bags together to make the trips around town to all these people's houses. It was a blessing for them who are going through a rough time with COVID right now. We want to thank them and hug them. And it was a blessing for us too. So, Braden and I are done with our deliveries and we're back home. It's middle of the afternoon now. Dog starts barking frantically that somebody is at the door. And out on my deck were a couple of folks delivering a Christmas bag to me. And they said, we know how hard you're working. We want you to know we see what you do. We want you to know we've noticed it and we want to give this hug to you. And my first thought was, you guys shouldn't be giving this to me. You should give it to somebody who needs it. And then my next thought was, I don't deserve this. And then my next thought was, well, I can use the ham because Darby has to take a pill twice a day and the only thing she'll take it in and swallow it is a piece of ham, so I'm into ham right now. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, who else could I give the bag to? I don't, this, I don't deserve this. Oh. Now, I've learned over the years to just say thank you most of the time. So all those things that were going through my mind, I didn't say out loud. I think I did say the thing about the ham, though. 
But still, there they are, all rolling around in there. I don't deserve it. I don't want to take a gift. Do you see what we do? We all do it, and I know I'm not alone with that. It is uncomfortable to be on the receiving end. So here we are, it's a few days before Christmas, the season of giving. We enjoy thinking of ourselves as basically generous, giving people. We have a lot of fun trying to figure out what to give for the people that we have on our shopping list. We want to please them. We want them to see in material form how much we love them. We're grateful. We want to show our gratitude by helping others less fortunate. One of the reasons that people love Christmas is because Christmas brings out the best in us. There's only one problem with any of that. It's a direct contradiction of the biblical account of Christmas. There, we are portrayed not as the givers we wish we were, but as the empty receivers we truly are. God wanted to do something so extraordinarily loving, so out of the box, so strange, so far beyond our abilities that he needed to call upon angels, and pregnant virgins and stars in the sky to pull that off. This gift is so far beyond us, so beyond the bounds of human effort and striving that God needed to resort to the utterly unnatural, supernatural means to call it off. We didn't think of it. We never could have imagined it. And even 2,000 years later, we can just barely understand it. All we can do, that first night in Bethlehem and ever since, is fall on our knees and receive the gift. <laughs> and that there's the rub, folks. All that independence, all that self-sufficiency, that desire we have to give to others rather than accept a gift ourselves, well, that is the very thing that keeps us from accepting the gift of Christmas. What we've done is taken the Savior of all creation and reduced him to this cute little baby in a manger. We gorge ourselves at this time of year on all the material aspects of giving and receiving presents. And we minimize the greatest gift of all. And many times we leave that greatest gift of all sitting in that straw and never open it. Because in order to open it, we first have to admit that we need it. And if you're an independent, pick yourself up by the bootstraps uh, kind of person, admitting you need help of any kind just hurts too much. Alcoholic Anonymous has 12 steps. And in order to recover from addiction, the first thing you have to do is embrace the first two of those steps. The first step was we came to believe we were powerless. The second step was we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us. That's the basis of our faith, folks. We came to understand how broken we are, how unable we are to rid ourselves of the sin that we carry, and we ask for help. 
from the one that we know can change our lives. A savior. A gift unlike any other gift. that We didn't create it. And there's nothing we can do to match it. The babe in the manger is a nice substitute for the Savior hanging on the cross. We can keep that baby in the box. We can keep him cute and cuddly. We can give thanks for him. We can give gifts in return to him, to others we love, to those less fortunate. Christmas is a great time to show our gratitude and love. But the real gift comes if we allow that baby to grow up. He gave himself on the cross because he loves us. Pure and simple. He didn't need to. He chose to. And we can never pay him back. When we come to that understanding of Christmas, we have come to that faith. It's tough being on the receiving end of gifts, gifts you don't deserve, gifts you can't pay back to even up the score. All you can do is say thank you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together and affirm our gift, our faith from, from the confession of 1967. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of man's mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness, but God reveals his love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful man. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of his love. Oh, holy child.
the little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love the Lord Jesus, look down from the sky. And stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I am thee to stay close by me forever and love me I pray bless all the dear children in thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee My friends, what's going on? I got one. I'm going to go first. <laughs> I asked everybody yesterday when we were delivering bags to have a story ready for this moment in the service to share. So I hope everybody will. But I'm going to share about the health center. Can I hear? You want her on the mic? to the health center we took nine bags over on friday we came over and packed a few up and went over there and they let us in the back door and uh, a few of them gathered around and they were blown away they said they feel forgotten sometimes and they were just so blessed so they cried we cried and uh it was wonderful. We really appreciate them and told them that, and uh, they appreciated what we did for them. Well, I kind of have two stories, I guess, about yesterday. One is, Braden and I had a delivery to make down um, Catlin Hollow, and I thought I knew the house this person lived in, but I didn't know the house they lived in. And we hunted and we hunted and with all the snow piled up, the numbers on mailboxes are kind of covered, you know? So we went back and forth and we found a number or so that went on the other side and then a number or so that went way the other direction and I said, there's only one house this can be. It's gotta be the house in the middle. So we went up there, took the bag up. They had a big German Shepherd in the house. And they weren't home. And this dog is standing at this big glass sliding door. And I thought, oh, please stay there. Oh, and so I left the bag on the porch. And I went home and I texted Jess Millard and said, I just left this. Do you know what their house looked like? Did I get the right house? And he said, is there this? Is there that? And I said, no, but there's a big German Shepherd dog. Oh, I think they do have a German Shepherd dog. And we went back and forth and I just thought, and Lori said, if it's the wrong house, God put it where he needed it to be. I got um, a message last night from the people and they're like, did you leave this on our porch? And I fessed up to it, and we had a nice conversation back and forth with that. But I, I want to tell you what the real kind of gift was for me yesterday, and I'm going to embarrass him, and I don't care. Um, Braden drove all over the place with this. Now, the roads, Cummings Creek was all right. There was some slush and crud and snow. And then Catlin Hollow was better than I really expected it to be. The problem came with the driveways. <laughs> they were not great. So we got to this one house and he had, I told him to back in and he started to leave and it sloped up. And I said, don't stop, don't stop. I was too late, he stopped. And you know, there he was. 
And I said, he said, now what do I do? And I said, back up. So he backs up. And I said, hit it again. Make sure nothing's coming, but don't stop. Well, that time it worked. So there's other houses like that with snow and snow banks and all the other good stuff. But then there's one not far from where we live that had not been plowed at all. And the people had a pickup truck. And they were able to come in and out of it. But they hadn't plowed or shoveled anything. And I said, go up that driveway. Oh, no. Oh, no. We're going to get stuck. I said, we're not going to get stuck. And I'm going, oh, please, God, don't let us get stuck. <laughs> I, said, I, said, <laughs> I said, we're not going to get stuck. You have to swing wide and hit it and get up there. And he said, I'm not going up there. I said, you're going up there. If you're going to drive this car, you're going to go up there. And he managed, and he got up there, and he said, now I'll never get out. I said, you'll get out. You have to hit it to get out, <laughs> make sure there's nothing coming, and hit it. But don't hit it so hard that you go across the road into the snowbank on the other side, or we will be stuck. So he gets in there, and he hits it. And with a bunch of sliding and a whole bit, which I expected, he got out. And we got home, and he said, I am never going in that driveway again. And I said, you know what? Yeah, you will. And I said, don't think I'm mean. Don't think I'm trying to do things to you that, you know, I said, this is exactly what learning to drive in snow means. You need to learn these skills. And I said, you did it, and you did fine, and I did it to you on purpose, so there, you did good. <laughs> And remember, too, folks, that the, these are not, these bags for Christmas dinner did not go to folks who are being cared for in other places, okay? Not folks that we normally would be helping with Christmas things. These went to folks who just needed a little bit of attaboy, who are going through tough times that normally wouldn't go through tough times, who are the kind that would pull themselves up by their bootstraps and say, I can do this, and not ask for help. Those are who those went to, and that was Christ at work. <laughs> In the name of the one born that we might live, we have come to do your will, O God. Our spirits rejoice in your saving mercy. Receive our offerings as a worldly expression of our gratitude for a love that knows no bounds. May our gifts be used to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to bring hope to a world in need. Amen. Our final hymn is Star Child. It is on the back of your bulletins. Those of you online don't have it. I'm sorry.
Let this be the year, come Lord Jesus, that you come for everyone, for all the children of the world, regardless of age, regardless of abilities, regardless of social standing or color of skin, that Christmas comes, that you come for your creation and your world. And now go in peace and may the love of God the grace through our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.